Welcome to episode 10 of Inside Politics, for teens, by teens, where I explore the politics and issues impacting our generation. I'm your host, Christina Lee, and today I'm focusing on coronavirus legislation. For this, I've invited Dan Coe, a member of the Town of Andover Select Board. Dan, how are you doing tonight? Hey, Christina, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So could you talk a little bit about your role and what exactly you've done in terms of um, responding to the coronavirus pandemic? Sure. Well, the Andover Select Board is a group of elected officials who work with the town manager and other officials uh, in the town to help plan for a number of different things uh, with regard to the town, including the town budget, including initiatives that the community is concerned about and and potholes that you're concerned about as well. So. Uh, we meet bi-weekly as a group. There are five of us, and we work very closely, as I mentioned, with town administration. So when it comes to coronavirus, this is something that the town has been tracking for quite some time. Um, and to the extent that you can prepare for something like this, uh, we've been working on it. So that involves making sure that the town is aware of what the coronavirus is, what are the dangers of, of the virus are, as well as being prepared to adhere to things like social distancing rules, um, not just by going out and saying that we need to do that, but by doing things that are practical and tactical. Like, for example, yesterday we uh, removed the nets from the tennis courts that are public tennis courts. We um, we we were putting up some signage so people know that they shouldn't be, um, you know, congregating in public spaces. So uh, the, the the select board is uh, the, one of the most on the ground forms of government that you will find. And for me personally, I really enjoy it because of the fact that you're so close to your constituents and able to make a lot of difference for them. Got it. So can you um, so how much autonomy do you guys have in terms of, I guess, like um, legislature? Like, do you have to adhere closely to what the state says and what the government, uh, the federal government says? There are a number of different um, parts to uh, government at, at the local level. So there are different rules that are governed by the state and then other things that are governed by the municipality. So for the things that the municipality has control over exclusively, there's certainly a lot that we can do and a lot of things that we have done. So one of the things that I am working on with my members of the select board is, for example, community choice aggregation, which allows for residents to be able to get uh, more uh, energy from more renewable sources than they otherwise would have. So that's something that completely within the jurisdiction of the town, for example, um, that we're working very closely on. So uh, and, and a lot of the town, the towns manage their own budget, for example, think about how they invest their, you know, their, their, um, their other aspects of, of, of the, uh, of the financial ledger. Um, and then thinking about how we plan for the future, making sure we're prepared for any potential liabilities financially as well. So, um, a lot of, a lot of autonomy, but then also a lot of working collaboratively with the state government as well. I see. So can you, I guess, um, what, so how does the select board's actions have to, um, I guess, agree with what the state is doing? Like, can you give some examples about like how you have to reach out to the state government and how you have to work closely with them? Yeah. So from a funding perspective, there's a lot of things. So the public school system in Andover, which actually the select board does not oversee, uh, the school committee oversees, uh, receives a lot of money from the state um, as, as part of the funding for the public schools. Uh, at the state level, for example, they offer they oversee certain uh, roadways uh, that are in the town of Andover, but are managed by the state. So a number of the initiatives and the areas of government um, related to making a town work uh, is is related is funded by and, and oftentimes overseen from a regulatory perspective by the state. So there are certain standards, for example, that that the town needs to hit. Um, to be compliant with some of the state rules. But as I said, there's a lot of things, too, that Andover has a lot of flexibility on. And there are these things called home rule petitions that you can file with the state um, that allow you to have a different rule locally than you otherwise would have at the state level. Got it. So I guess, like, could I solicit your thoughts on how Governor Baker is handling the crisis in Massachusetts? Well, I think what we're trying to do as a state is to try to be as collaborative as, as possible in this environment. Um, look, I think there are some things that the governor has done well. I think there are some things that we could have done a lot better. Um, but I think more importantly, in this time of coronavirus, it's making sure that we are um, getting the right services uh, to to the town. Um, and, and that is making sure, for example, that 
people have the right uh, protective equipment when they're when they're in the hospitals and when they're when they're in our case, you know, uh, first responders, for example. And that's something that we have to work very collaboratively with the state on. Um, but Andrew Flanagan, who's our town manager, is fantastic. We are fortunate to have recently renewed his contract for another five years. So he's going to be staying with us. Um, is working very closely with the state on all of these issues, making sure that we have the right tools to be as prepared as possible. Got it. So I guess like going back to my earlier question, in regards to coronavirus, do you guys get all of your funding from the state or do you guys also have your own budget to, I guess, buy like personal protective equipment? We have our own budget um, for a lot of what we do. So, for example, there is some stuff that, that the, the state can provide from a public safety perspective, but the fire department, the police department, all of those have their own budgets where they can purchase protective equipment from. Um, but again, I think especially when it comes to emergency needs, uh, a lot of the kind of big checks that, that are outside of our scope potentially uh, can come from the state government. But I think a lot of the work that's been done so far has been uh, has, has been worked within the confines of our current budget at the town. And I give a lot of credit to the to the people of uh, the town hall who have done a lot of good job on it. Got it. So can I also solicit your thoughts on the federal government's handling of the crisis? Yeah, you know, I, I, I ran for Congress in 2018, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not shy about criticizing uh, President Trump. Um, look, this is not, uh, a, as, as, as Vice President Biden has said in the past, this is not the fault of Donald Trump that this virus exists, but certainly the reaction to it is. Um, and I think we are seeing more and more evidence of the fact that the administration knew about this early on could have done a lot more to prevent it, but didn't. Um, and I think every side of the aisle can probably agree that what we're seeing in the press conferences of, you know, um, the, the kind of saber rattling and theater is not helping anybody. Um, you know, Dr. Anthony Fauci, a lot of people don't realize this, but he's almost 80 years old. Donald Trump is his 10th president um, that, that he's served under, which is pretty stunning. Um, and he's probably one of the most if not the foremost infectious disease expert that this country has. So the notion that he would sit in the corner and not be allowed to talk while the president is saying that some drug might work for a coronavirus is just fundamentally uh, inconceivable. And so I think a leader who is putting himself um, you know, first and putting his opinions on cures while not being a doctor first, while experts are standing in the background is not the kind of leader that should be leading in a time of crisis. And it concerns me that we just see that snippet of him, maybe one or two hours a day. It concerns me that that person with that kind of affect and personality and viewpoint is making the decisions all day long. Mm -hmm. So I guess, like, do you have thoughts on how this pandemic is going to affect the election in November? Or, I mean, like, the Democrat, like, Sanders already dropped out. So we know that Biden's going to be the Democratic nominee. So I yep. guess, like, do you see, I don't, like, I guess, like, what are your thoughts on how the pandemic is going to affect, like, voter turnout and I guess, like, how the election is going to swing? Yeah, uh, you know, it's very difficult to tell because the, uh, we hope that hospitalizations continue to drop with regard to coronavirus. We hope that fewer people pass away as a result of coronavirus, but we just don't know. Um, I personally, as someone who's incredibly passionate about voter rights, I was incredibly <laughs> horrified to see what was happening in Wisconsin. And for some of your viewers who may not know what happened, essentially there was an election on was in Wisconsin on Tuesday, yesterday, um, that involved uh, a couple a, a candidate for the Wisconsin Supreme Court who was a Republican, and the Republican legislature basically forced through having this election occur, even though the governor of Wisconsin tried to stop it. Um, that's something that I think is absolutely unacceptable. We're trying to teach people the importance of social distancing. There wasn't really an opportunity for voters in Wisconsin to not uh, to avoid the social distancing, uh, to, to comply with social distancing while trying to vote. And literally was both voter suppression and putting voters at risk. There were pe people who will die in Wisconsin as a result of that partisan led decision. Um, and so I think at the very least, we need to be incredibly thoughtful about how we prepare for voting in the time of coronavirus. So, for example, Oregon as a state has mail-in voting. So everyone is mailed, about, and, and you can vote by mail. In, in 
Massachusetts, we have a absentee voting system. But A, you have to have a certain set of reasons as to why you're absentee voting. So it's not just that you don't want to go to the polls that day. You have to be either out of the area, sick or something like that. So in order to vote absentee, you have to request a ballot, have the ballot be sent to you. Then you have to mail it back with a stamp, all that kind of thing. We need to be very thoughtful and proactive. And we're running out of time, quite frankly, about what voting should look like in an era where people shouldn't have to, A, go to the polls and, and be in big crowds. B, that the poll workers themselves, many of whom are very have to be exposed to thousands and thousands of people a day as a result of trying to do their civic duty. And then finally, all of the security that is involved with putting on uh, an election, you know, they, they don't they don't call attention to themselves. But if you go to any poll location, you'll see police officers and other law enforcement there to protect voters. Um, and those people are now putting their lives on the line because we haven't been nimble enough to think through how we do it in this environment. Right. Um, not to mention the fact that you're looking at signature gathering right now. Um, there is no way to submit a signature online. The only way to do that is to get physical signatures to give to the various clerk's offices right now in Massachusetts. All of these things can be solved by technologies. You know this, Christina. You can easily download a PDF and, and scan it and send it. That, doesn't, that, will, that will be seen as not a signature right now. These are these things that need to be modernized anyway. Frankly, it's stunning that we haven't done it yet, and this is what we need to be doing um, in the not just for coronavirus, but just to make ballot access easier. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I guess, like, lastly, how do you think the politics of this crisis will end up affecting my generation, Generation Z? Well, I, look, I hope it's I hope it's uh, uh, yet another reminder that your generation is the future and should get as civically involved as possible, right? Um, there's a couple of things. First, awareness. I think there is a there is a stereotype that the that the younger generation in the era of coronavirus isn't as aware of or doesn't care enough about uh, coronavirus and how serious it is. But the reality is up to upwards of 25 percent of people who have coronavirus don't know they have it and are asymptomatic. So even though someone your age may not feel any symptoms, you could go see your loved ones and pass it on to them without them knowing. And so people need to be aware of that and they need to be they need to understand the seriousness of that and that they should stay home and, and, and adhere to those rules. I think, secondly, they should realize why preparedness and a good government that is prepared for responding to situations like this is so important. Obviously, as a Democrat, I'm, I'm biased, but I feel as if, um, you know, I feel as if uh, having good leadership and democratic leadership in this environment is, is, is incredibly important. And at the very least, competent leadership. My opinion is that this was completely handled the wrong way. We knew this was coming. We saw what was happening in China and Hong Kong, and we didn't do enough to prevent what is happening now. And we need, especially in a time of crisis, you need a good leader. That's when you need a, a leader the most. And it's clear that leadership that we have here has put us behind the eight ball with regard to coronavirus and lives are being lost as a result. So I hope it also makes the younger generation realize why that's so important and be even more fired up to get involved in politics uh, in, in preparation of the November election. Got it. All right, Dan, thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see everybody next time on Inside Politics. Hey, everyone, this is Christina. Thank you so much for watching Inside Politics. Please be sure to check out the outtakes linked in the description, and feel free to check out the rest of the interviews on my channel as well. See you next time.